Hello, I'm Alex Howe, and if you've been following this channel, you probably know that I'm an astrophysics postdoc at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. I primarily study exoplanets, including topics like processes that can cause them to lose their atmospheres, and studying their spectra to figure out what their atmospheres are made of. I gave a public talk about my work last summer that you can watch to learn more about that, or you can check out my new Exoplanets Review series to learn more about the general state of the field. However, I do sometimes branch out and study other areas of astrophysics. And in this case, this is something a bit further afield than usual. I came to this idea more through my love of science fiction. But the great thing about astrophysics, and all science really, is that sometimes things that sound like science fiction can become serious topics for research. In this video, I want to talk about a paper I wrote about terraforming Venus. Yes, that's right, Venus. We hear about terraforming Mars all the time, but Venus, not so much. But I had an idea about a better way to do it than I had seen elsewhere, and when I did the math, it seemed to work out, so I wrote a paper about it. This paper has been published in the Journal of the British Interplanetary Society, and you can view the preprint version publicly on archive.org, link in the description. So, how did I end up writing a paper about terraforming Venus? Well, last summer, the popular YouTube channel Kurzgesagt in a Nutshell put out a video on this topic. There was a lot of good and interesting science in that video, but it focuses on one particular idea for how to terraform Venus that doesn't seem like it would be the most practical. And in fact, I recognized the paper they were basing it on immediately, Terraforming Venus Quickly by Paul Birch, 1991. Do note that in this context, quickly means 200 years. I had already read that paper some time earlier, but I thought it had some shortcomings. I had an alternative idea focusing on terraforming Venus efficiently, which I'd been mulling over in a science fiction context for a while. However, after I saw that it was a topic of interest, and after discussing it with some colleagues, I was inspired to write it up properly. And that became this paper, Cloud Continents, Terraforming Venus Efficiently by Means of a Floating Artificial Surface. That does sound an awful lot like science fiction, doesn't it? And yes, this is a very speculative paper, but I did take a serious look at the question, and I really believe that it is something that could be done in principle if we wanted to. This video gives an outline of how to do it, and you can find more details, including all of my calculations, in the paper. When we're talking about terraforming planets, we want to turn this into this. We want to create an environment similar to Earth or more generally, an environment where humans can live without spacesuits or oxygen masks or anything like that. Temperature, atmospheric composition, and the ability to grow food all need to be in the range near Earth, and need to be sustainable. Usually with terraforming, we're talking about Mars. Long before we knew how brutal Venus really was, Mars was already a more popular place to meet aliens in science fiction. And with our modern scientific knowledge, it seems a lot more inviting at first glance. But it turns out that Venus does have a few advantages. Venus has Earth-like gravity, while Mars has much lower gravity, which could pose health risks for humans long term. Venus also has a very thick atmosphere. And while that's usually seen as a problem, one very good thing it does is to protect from radiation. Mars has a very thin atmosphere that would not provide as much protection as we would like for colonists. Also, while Venus is very hot, the upper atmosphere isn't. And meanwhile, Mars turns out to be too cold to warm up easily with the usual greenhouse gas solution. You would need a more complex technical solution to keep the planet warm, but that's beyond the scope of this video. And there's one other very good reason to go to Venus. It's cheaper than going to Mars. Venus's orbit is closer to Earth's than Mars's, and it costs less fuel to get there. This picture is a bit oversimplified, I'm only showing the difference in orbital speeds, but that's enough to get the picture. Also, it only takes half as long to get to Venus, and launch windows open more often. If you need to haul massive amounts of equipment across interplanetary distances to do the terraforming, those savings are going to add up. Of course, the problems with Venus are obvious. The atmosphere is massive, and it's mostly carbon dioxide. It has over 90 times Earth's atmospheric pressure at the surface. And it's hot. Scientists always say that Venus is hot enough to melt lead, 
I really don't like that analogy. Molten lead doesn't mean that much to most people nowadays. I like to say that Venus is as hot as a pizza oven. Good news if you're a pizza, bad news if you want to eat the pizza. It's also very acidic, with the famous sulfuric acid rain. It's extremely dry. All the water on Venus is only a fifth as much as we have in Earth's atmosphere alone. Oh, and did I mention 90 bars of CO2? That's equal to 900 meters of water, or 3,000 feet. That's a lot, and you're not going to just get rid of it. Not easily. Paul Birch's solution, which seems to be the one that's quoted most often, is to put a giant mirror in front of Venus to block out all the sunlight. Over 200 years, this will not only cool off the planet, but cause the entire atmosphere to freeze into a mile-deep layer of dry ice. Then you have to do something with all that dry ice. Birch's idea was to cover the entire surface with insulating foam so that we can ship it off-world at a later date. That would be a real challenge, though. We're talking about a literal ocean's worth of CO2. Venus's atmosphere weighs 475 quadrillion tons. Lifting that much mass out of the gravity well would take thousands of years. And even then, it's not clear where you'd put it. That's why most people talk about colonizing Venus rather than terraforming it. And the standard solution for colonizing Venus is Cloud Cities. No, not the Star Wars Cloud City. This kind of Cloud City. Floating habitats carried high in the atmosphere by giant zeppelins. This has actually been proposed. Well, not proposed as an actual mission, but as a mission concept and a serious idea for a viable Venusian colony. This works because of two basic facts about Venus's atmosphere. First, oxygen and nitrogen are lighter than carbon dioxide. That means on Venus, regular Earth air is a lifting gas. And Venus already has nitrogen that we can use in its atmosphere. No messing around with hydrogen or helium for lift. Second, it turns out that Venus's upper atmosphere is by far the most Earth-like place in the solar system. You know, besides Earth. This is a graph of the temperature and pressure of Venus's atmosphere in blue compared with Earth's in green. Venus's atmosphere may be incredibly hot and high pressure at the surface, but as you go up, both of those things get better, and there's a narrow range of altitudes where both the temperature and pressure are habitable to humans. It's not an exact match because Venus is closer to the sun, and there's still the acid rain to worry about, but it's good enough that you don't need a spacesuit, only an oxygen mask and the latest in Teflon fashion. This isn't the only proposed solution. In 2011, Jeffrey Landis suggested a couple others. One of them was to build a giant tower up 50 kilometers from the surface. This is difficult, though not impossible, with plausible materials. Another was to genetically engineer plants to live floating high in the clouds to terraform the upper atmosphere, although this doesn't exactly resolve how to build the colonies. But I have a different idea, something even more ambitious than cloud cities or a tower built from the surface. As I said at the start, I'm talking about cloud continents. I'm talking about building an artificial surface over the entire planet floating up in the cloud layer and only putting the parts of the atmosphere we want on top of it. Sound crazy? Maybe, but I think it's a lot less crazy than trying to freeze the entire atmosphere and ship it somewhere else. I originally thought we could build the artificial surface out of aerogel, the super light material that's basically foamed glass and is almost lighter than air itself. If it was filled with nitrogen, it would float in Venus's atmosphere. But while aerogel is famously strong for its weight, it's so light that its overall strength is nowhere near enough to support a surface like this. So instead, I fell back on a tried-and-true sci-fi staple, carbon nanotubes. Here's how it works. Venus's atmosphere is 96.5% carbon dioxide and 3.5% nitrogen, plus some trace gases. The carbon dioxide can be cracked into carbon and oxygen. Using the carbon, you build aerostats, essentially large airships filled with ambient nitrogen for lift. I like to call them tiles because what you need to do is tile the entire planet with them. This is a big undertaking. But the good news is that this is the only step that has to be done all at once before you can proceed. The rest of the constructions can run in parallel. Other terraforming schemes tend to have several steps like that. 
the top surface of the aerostat tiles will need to be partially mirrored to reflect sunlight. Venus's upper atmosphere is at a habitable temperature because the clouds reflect so much sunlight away. We'll have to keep doing that to keep the upper atmosphere cool. But we're also going to need solar panels. In fact, pretty much the whole planet needs to be covered in solar panels to get enough power. So it's going to be a trade-off with how much light is reflected versus how much is used for power. Now, once the entire planet is enclosed, you can start separating the nitrogen out from the atmosphere and pumping it up above the new tile surface. And you can also crack some CO2 to get oxygen, which you can also pump up above the tile surface. Once this is done, you'll have used about a quarter of the nitrogen and 0.3% of the CO2. And you'll have an atmosphere essentially identical to Earth's above the tiles. And this way, you don't need to get rid of Venus's massive atmosphere. It can stay right where it is, below the tiles. Now, that's all well and good, but aerostats don't support a whole lot of weight. Just like you need a huge blimp to lift a small gondola. These tiles aren't going to be enough to lift a whole colony. So what do you do? You stack them. What you need to do is build a 3D honeycomb of cells, kind of like the aerostats, except this is the surface that you want to build on. And not just colonies, but an entire biosphere. Soil, water reservoirs, forests, everything. Soil alone is going to be about two tons of weight per square meter if it's a meter deep. To generate enough lift to support that much weight, you're going to need to extract a lot of the remaining nitrogen in the atmosphere. In fact, in my standard model, I used all of it. With that amount of nitrogen, the honeycomb needs to be almost 7 kilometers, or a little over 4 miles thick and it can lift 7.5 tons per square meter. To build the honeycomb, you can use the carbon left over from the oxygen production. It turns out that to produce an atmosphere, you wind up with a lot more carbon than you need for just the tiles. Even so, the size of the honeycomb will spread it pretty thin, so it needs to be made of an extremely strong form of carbon, like aggregated diamond nanorods, which are stronger in compression than carbon nanotubes. I suspect the best material would be some kind of nanotube nanorod composite, but that's a question for materials scientists. Also, by moving with the prevailing winds of the upper atmosphere, the entire shell will rotate around the planet about once every nine days, rather than Venus's own 117-day solar rotation. So the light-dark cycles will be much less brutal than if we built at ground level. There's one more thing you can do while you're waiting for the atmospheric engineering to finish and the honeycomb to be built. Once you have small chunks of it built, you have a floating island on which you can build a colony. All you have to do is enclose a pocket of fully processed, breathable atmosphere. And with the aerostats, you can make a dome as big as a city without worrying about its structural strength. So, we could start populating Venus long before the terraforming is complete. Now, you may have noticed that the honeycomb only has a lifting capacity of 7.5 tons per square meter. That doesn't sound like very much. It's only 24 feet of water, after all. Pretty shallow for something like a lake or a large river, which we're going to need for a functioning biosphere. Can it really support enough weight to build one, plus cities and other infrastructure? Well, there's not a huge margin, but yes, there is enough. Even the most biomass-heavy ecosystem on Earth, a redwood forest, weighs quite a bit less than the soil it needs to grow, which is typically about 2 tons per cubic meter and a couple meters deep. Most buildings and infrastructure will be okay, and even water reservoirs will be able to be built, although they'll be pretty shallow. You can even have hills and valleys by contouring the surface. It's only dense urban cores that would be too heavy to lift, and even then an isolated skyscraper may be okay if it's supported by a larger section of the surface. So, is this actually doable? And how long will it take? Well, what I've shown here is a best-case scenario. There will probably be complications, and there's very little reason to think that we would even start such a project this century. Not before we've cleaned up Earth's climate, for one. But looking over all the requirements, I don't see anything that's fundamentally impossible. The biggest limitation is going to be energy. It takes a lot of energy to break CO2 into carbon and oxygen and it takes even more energy to separate nitrogen from the atmosphere, because you basically need to use a refrigerator to freeze the CO2 into dry ice bit by bit. If you cover the entire planet with solar panels, breaking up enough CO2 to produce a breathable atmosphere will take 30 years. Like I said, it's a lot of energy. 
and that's assuming an end-to-end -end efficiency of 20%, so nothing crazy, and there's still room to reflect enough sunlight like I said earlier. But it's a lot of energy. Separating the nitrogen from the atmosphere is even worse. That will take 170 years. But most of the other steps are faster. The only other one that's energy limited is importing water. You have to deliver it by space elevator from Mars. I explain why in the paper. And you have to cover Mars with solar panels to do it. So you might want to go ahead and terraform Mars first. But you can still do that in parallel with the other steps. Add it up, and in a best case scenario, we could terraform Venus in 200 years. Which happens to be the same time frame Paul Birch came up with. But this plan has the advantage of not needing to move Venus's massive atmosphere out, or move a whole ocean of water in. Which is not something you can do with solar power. Not in this millennium, anyway. So to be sure, it's very much a long-term project, and it would take a lot of technological development to get there. But terraforming Venus does look like it's doable. Which is surprising for a planet that's usually described as the most hostile place in the solar system. Only time will tell if we really want to try it.